Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Robert Rayburn. It is March 31st of 2022, and it's hard to believe that it's the last day of the quarter. And thank God, uh, because it's been a rough quarter. Uh, we know that whether you're a stock investor or you got money tucked away in bonds, uh, it's been a bad first quarter. In fact, for bonds, it's been the worst quarter in history, the worst first quarter in history. And so what we really want to do today is focus on really the path forward, but also how do we invest through a period of such elevated pessimism? And how do we use pessimism as a future asset for our for our investment accounts. And so we're going to go through all of that today. In fact, the title of today's presentation is Investing Past the Apocalypse. Now, it sounds kind of scary, but if you really think about it, Q1 for many people really had that feeling of uh, really being apocalyptic. And why is that? We had a showdown with Russia that has 5,000 nuclear warheads. We've had an ongoing hot war between Russia and the Ukraine that has unleashed incredible amounts of commodity related inflation in the form of oil and food prices, as well as natural gas if you're living over in Europe. And so all of these factors combined with high global inflation even before the war and rising interest rates and this idea of the rising cost of money, we see it in mortgage rates going from two and a half to 5%. All of these factors combined have really increased the level of pessimism in the overall global economy. Here's the good news though. When we look at investor sentiment, when we look at positioning, which is also key, it's never been more bearish. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is bullish. And so I, there's gonna be three things that we wanna focus on today. One is, are there reasons to be bullish going into Q2? I think I just gave you one of them, but we'll go into others. Number two, the impact of financial repression and what that means for stocks, bonds, and cash. And lastly, how is the overall economy holding up? Now, there are many reasons to be bullish. And one, of course, is that a lot of the bad news has been priced in. So when we look at overall institutional portfolio managers, the level of institutional investor cash is sitting at 2009 levels. What happened in 2009? The bottom of the secular bear market from 2000 to 2009. Number two, retail sentiment is at its worst since April of 09. When in 2009 did stocks bottom? March of 09. So again, very key dates here as it relates to the level of pessimism and what that meant for forward returns during those peak moments of pessimism. Number three, the intelligence sentiment, uh, investors intelligence sentiment is at its worst since 09. Number four, consumer confidence is at its lowest since 2009. Can you believe that? Even though unemployment's at 4%, even though wages have generally been rising, yes, there's been an offset with inflation, but certainly nothing like what we experienced in 2008 with you know, double digit unemployment, people getting kicked out of their houses. That was a really rough time period along with falling stock prices. And so whenever consumer confidence gets this low, we always want to invest. Uh, we actually want to buy stocks into that negative sentiment. We talked about that last week. If you want to tune into last week's episode, it is available on YouTube. We go through that. Every time you're at the lower end of the consumer confidence range, that's when you buy. When you're at the very high end, that's when you sell. And lastly, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ are massively oversold. And we look at the NASDAQ in particular, we look at the Williams oscillator. So we look at a really sort of relative price action going back for the last 52 weeks. And what we see right now is the level of stocks that are defined as oversold really got to a record level really about a month ago. And that was when we mentioned that we think we're pretty close to a durable low. We saw that during other time periods, such as March of 2020, March of 2009, December of 2018, and of course, the big low for the NASDAQ in 2001, 2002. So when things get this oversold, this is when we want to lean in and start chipping away in terms of our buys. And on February 24th, over 40% of the S&P 500 stocks were actually in a bear market. And believe it or not, nine times out of nine that this has happened in the past 30 years, stocks were higher 12 months later. The only exception are when we have recessions. 
And we're going to go through why we don't think there's a recession anywhere close right now. But you can see here on the chart on the right, the percentage of S&P 500 members down 20% or more from their 52-week highs has generally more often than not uh, aligned with positive forward rate to return and a durable bottom in the overall stock market. We see here uh, the March 2020 low, December 2018, February 2016. People forget 2016 was a really rough start to the year. The U.S. debt downgrade and, of course, that March of 2009 low. Now, we get a lot of pushback uh, because people are dealing with very high inflation. And that really makes them feel bad because you, you feel it every single day, whether you're filling up your gas tank, you're going out to, you're going out to eat for dinner, or uh, you're just going to the grocery store and you're seeing those rising food prices. And a lot of us can get suckered into this belief that, well, this is structural, it is permanent, I'm going to be dealing with this year in, year out, especially if you listen to the news media right now. But what we want to do is really break down what's driving inflation. And right now we're dealing with three episodic waves or tsunami waves of inflation. Why do we call it episodic? Because they come in big surges and just as quickly as they come, they start to surge away. But we've had three in a row and that's what it's made it, made it feel like that it's non-transitory. We actually kind of agree with the Fed's original thesis that inflation is fairly transitory. The problem is we've had these three waves. The first wave are the huge supply chain imbalances. Factories shut down in Asia. As a result, a lot of the, their suppliers also broke down in terms of a lot, some of them went bankrupt and some of them took a long time to restart their operations. And that led to the number two wave of inflation, right? So one was really the supply side the other was the demand wave that we saw in the U.S. The U.S. injected trillions of dollars of stimulus, gave us checks, high unemployment benefits. And what did consumers do with that since they couldn't go out to dinner, since they couldn't go out to travel? They bought a ton of goods. And that's a problem because when we have a lot of money to spend and we can't go to travel and we can't go out to eat, we buy a bunch of stuff. And the problem is that stuff couldn't be made by those factories because of problem number one. So the first wave fed into the second wave and vice versa, that second wave fed into the first wave. So we had the biggest consumer economy restart while most of the suppliers to the biggest consumer economy in the world were still shut down. And we saw that continued shutdown uh, really uh, throughout last year in terms of ongoing waves of COVID. And then lastly, the commodity shock from the war. But what we notice is that those break even rates of inflation, so in other words, expected inflation out in the future, defined by this blue line right here, really starts to drop off into the future. And that tells us the market is, despite all the present day fears, starting to price in a more normalized rate of inflation uh, over the coming months and years beyond today. And so when we think of that, when we think, okay, if inflation has peaked, what does that mean for rates? Well, rates are somewhat probably after the market price in eight to 10 rate hikes, probably start to ease back a little bit. So what happens when inflation eases back and rates ease back? Well, that's probably good for stocks that got killed when inflation went up and when rates went up. So think about that for a second. But before we get there, there's really limited options that we have for our money. The first is, we can buy stocks or we can buy bonds or we can hold it in cash. And that's really, really important because the cash has to go somewhere. It can sit in itself in cash, bonds or stocks. So the relative attraction uh, to each other, right? So in other words, how attractive an asset class is relative to the other available options is really what drives price. And what we see right now is if we look here in the bottom, uh, the, the bottom of this table here, is that we see that the real yields on bonds and cash are negative. What does that mean? So right now, the two-year yields about 2.5%. The expected rate of inflation two years from now is about 5%. So that means you are losing 2.5% on your money by owning a 2.5% yielding two-year bond, right? Because inflation is rising faster than the yield on the bond. The same holds true for a 10-year bond, where the expected rate of inflation is about 
and it's only yielding about 2.38%. So you are voluntarily losing money on your investments if you own a bond, or it's even worse if you own cash because you're losing 3% or 5% if on a two-year bond, or sorry, in terms of cash over two years. But here's the good news. Inflation is bad for cash and it's bad for bonds, but it's actually when real rates are negative, that's actually really good for stocks. It's only happened two, really two other times in terms of duration. One is right after World War I, and second is after World War II. And why is that? Because the government artificially suppresses rates below the rate of inflation so that it can inflate away all of that debt that it accumulated during those periods of high spending. Why do they do that? Well, they do it because it's the easiest way to get rid of the debt versus raising taxes or of course defaulting, which is not an option. So the next question then is what about, what about the economy? Do we think it's going to go into a recession? The answer is no. We do think it's gonna slow though. And the reason why we think it's going to slow is because we've had a huge buildup in inventories. So when a company buys a good off its supplier, it adds to GDP growth, right? Now, the problem is if you buy a bunch of goods and add it to your inventory, that takes up present day GDP. But now you've got to sell that through. And so what happens is that we're really borrowing the future growth and putting it into today's growth. And that means the more we buy today, the less we have to buy tomorrow. So in other words, if you go and buy an iPhone today, you don't have to buy that iPhone in September unless you break it, of course. So what we generally expect is that as more and more people are spending money on services versus goods, we should see prices for those high inventories come down as, as stores try to unload those inventories. And that should lower the rate of growth, which should lower rates, which should be good for high duration assets or assets or stocks that didn't do well when inflation and growth went up back in 2021. That's technology, that's biotech and healthcare, that's consumer goods. So all of these things should outperform if that scenario comes true. And then of course, in terms of a recession, this is what a recession doesn't look like, ladies and gentlemen, job opening is near an all time high. That just doesn't happen during a recession. But recessions are characterized by rising jobless claims, falling job openings, and rising unemployment. So the bottom line is, yes, Q1 was miserable, but there's a lot of good signs ahead of us. Investors are dramatically pessimistic and positioned as such. That's bullish. We see those three inflation tsunamis beginning to ease. That should moderate prices. That should moderate rates. That should be good for secular growth stocks which we're positioned in. And then lastly, job openings are near record highs and that is just quite simply not recessionary. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, have a fantastic week and weekend. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to your advisor or our home office here in San Diego, California. Thank you again and have a fantastic week.